Do you know about the man who like escaped prison just by using a bowl of soup? No. So I saw a video by Thought82, and when you think of someone like escaping prison, you think they have like a really complex plan or they have like special tools to break them out. But for Japanese prisoner Yoshi Shiratori, he actually just used a bowl of soup to escape. How? So before Shiratori went to jail, he was like a fisherman, like he had a bunch of goals for his family. But sadly, he couldn't get a better job because he didn't have like the proper education. So he like turned to gambling and everything went wrong when he started going into gambling. He ended up getting accused for a murder that he says he never committed. Even Shiratori said, that he did not commit the murder but nobody believed him so he got thrown in jail but luckily for him after a few weeks he was able to find like a metal like wire and he was able to break himself out of jail because he was a locksmith what the heck but get this a couple days later after escaping he got arrested again but this time they put him in a jail cell and there was like a vent like a skylight vent above him there was rusted screws and he was able to break the screws and oh he escaped again so he's gotten away twice now yeah so after he got away the second time he went to go visit his friend who's a police officer but then his friend called the police on him and then Shiratori got arrested again but this time when they put shitori in prison they put him in a max security prison so there was no chance of escaping this guy could not catch a break so this prison was built so that no one could escape and this time they put iron shackles around his ankles and like handcuffs around his wrists so oh. that he could not escape so the cell had no windows all it had was thick walls by the front there was like a little slot for food okay so every day after getting beat up by like the guards and the prisoners shiratori would receive a bowl of hot soup but shiratori decided not to eat the soup because he realized that the soup had high levels of salt in it and salty liquids when put on iron material, it can actually make it rust and break away. Dude, no way. Yeah, and for months, Shiratori would spit the hot soup on his handcuffs and his shackles and like the little food slot, so it'd slowly start rusting away, and slowly and eventually broke open. Shut up. He then dislocated his shoulders, and he fit right through the food slot and escaped. Dude, this guy's a genius. Yeah, he's the only one to ever escape the prison, but this story gets even crazier. So after Shiratori escaped the prison by using a bowl of soup, he fled to the mountains, but it was really tough conditions, because it was like snowing, and there was a lack of food and he had to live in caves so it was like really brutal he lived in caves yeah it was really tough for him so after living in the mountains for two years he realized that he was running out of resources and it was unbearable to live so he decided to move to like a local japanese town so when he got to the japanese town he noticed like a bunch of farmland and he saw a bunch of tomatoes growing so he was starving so he went to go eat the tomatoes okay so shiratori was eating all the tomatoes right and then all of a sudden the owner of the farm came up to shiratori and was really upset that he was eating his tomatoes oh boy so the farmer was really upset at shiratori and he literally tried to kill him but out of self-defense shiratori Shiratori accidentally killed the farmer. No! So Shiratori was arrested again, but this time he had no chance. He was given the death sentence. And while he was waiting for his execution, he was put in a 100% proof cell. So there was no way of him getting out. And there were six guards guarding his cell at all times watching him so that he couldn't get out. Don't tell me he gets out of this one. So days would pass by and the guards realized that Shiratori was really depressed because he realized that there was no way of getting out this time. They said that all Shiratori would do is basically just lie in his bed and sleep because this time there was no skylight vent, there was no lock, there was no little food slot so he was stuck he's done well that's what everyone thought until one of the guards realized that shiratori was gone stop it so shiratori at nighttime when the guards thought he was sleeping he was actually digging a tunnel underneath his bed and he broke the floorboards and he actually tucked it underneath his sheets so it made it look like he was sleeping and get this he used a soup bowl to dig his way out like using it as a shovel you gotta be kidding me yeah so years after escaping he got tired of running and basically just said i'm gonna turn myself in and he went back to jail but this time the government realized that shiratori was actually a good person and they let him go early on good behavior so he only had to serve 14 years in prison there's even a statue in japan of shiratori to remember his name this is the craziest prison break story i've ever heard do you know about the man who hijacked an airplane using a samurai sword no so i saw a video by kento bento and when you think of an airplane hijacking you think it'd be like almost impossible to do right with like metal detectors and security this story is so crazy and has the craziest twist why'd they hijack the plane so this happened on japan flight 351 and it was a flight from tokyo japan to fukuoka japan on the airplane there was 122 passengers and there was a bunch of college students like businessmen tourists the ceo of pepsi and the roman catholic priest from the united states were also on the flight okay so an hour before the plane was about to land one of the college students walked to the front of the plane and told everyone that he's hijacking the plane and he threatened to kill everyone. What? His name was Takumaru Tamiya and he pulled out a samurai sword out of his coat and all the passengers went crazy. Tamiya also had partners on the plane that came to help him. They were college students? Yeah, the youngest member was only 16 years old, but this story gets crazy. So Tamiya and his men started to try to break down the cockpit doors so they could get to the pilots and Tamiya had his men tie down all the male passengers on the plane so that no one could fight back. Once Tamiya got into the cockpit, he told the pilots that they have to fly to Cuba because Tamiya was a part of a communist 
communist cult and he wanted North Korea and Cuba to respect him and he also wanted military training. Basically, he wanted to start a war. Dude, that's scary. Tamiya and his nine men were willing to die for their plan and they were willing to kill all the passengers on the plane. The pilots told Tamiya that they were running out of fuel before they could get to Cuba, so they had to land in Fukuoka, Japan. The Japanese government and the US government tried to negotiate with Tamiya to get all the passengers off the plane like safely. Tamiya said that he would only let 23 passengers go in exchange for fuel for the plane. So the government agreed to give him fuel in exchange for the 23 passengers. But keep in mind, there's still like 100 passengers on the plane. So what happens to the ones that didn't get off? It gets pretty crazy. And Tamiya realized that Cuba was too far of a flight, so he decided to find the nearest communist country, which was North Korea. So the Japanese government gave the pilots like a hand-drawn map of North Korea because the pilots had never gone there. But this story has the craziest twist. Yeah, no one's even allowed there. So they fueled up the plane and took off to North Korea. But you gotta remember, there's still over 100 innocent lives on the plane. And the passengers knew if they got to North Korea, North Korea would probably kill them because they're a communist country. So what did they do? So when they got to North Korea, all of a sudden these military jets came out of the sky and started shooting at them. And the pilots had no idea what was going on because they've never been to North Korea before. All the pilots had was just like a little hand-drawn map and they had no idea what was going on. But Tamiya was not scared. He told the pilots, keep flying towards North Korea. And then all of a sudden the jets stopped shooting at them and they radioed to the airplane and said, Tamiya, you can land in North Korea. What? So when the plane landed in North Korea, there were a bunch of people there to greet them. There were like military workers, soldiers, civilians, even a choir was there to greet them. They were all holding like welcome signs and it looked like the North Korean people were really happy that they were there. Tamiya and his men were so happy to be in North Korea, but the passengers on the plane were so scared because they know they're, they're about to be killed. The North Korean soldier greeted Tamiya and his men and let them leave the plane. But this story has the craziest Uno reverse card moment ever. How do you get out of this? So you see the Japanese government and the US government had a plan all along. They knew that Tamiya was not going to give up the passengers until he got what he wanted. So they made Tamiya and his men think they landed in North Korea, but really they landed in South Korea. The Japanese government hired fake military jets to shoot fake bullets at the plane and even hired fake actors to pretend like they're North Korean soldiers. And they even hired actors to be fake North Korean civilians. They even changed all the flags and all the posters to make it look like North Korea. Wait, how did they get the pilots to fly to South Korea instead? You see, back when the Japanese government gave the pilots that small little map of North Korea, there was a small little note on it with directions on what to do. So in the end, Tamiya and his men all got arrested, but all the passengers were set free and everyone was safe. Okay, I'm still wondering how he got the samurai sword on the plane. Do you know the real life story about the woman in the ceiling? Woman in the ceiling? So in 2008, there was a guy named Joe Cummings and he lived in a one bedroom apartment. So it had like one bathroom, a kitchen and a living room. He lived with his girlfriend and both of them worked jobs during the day. So they wouldn't get home until like 5 p.m. Okay. So one day Joe noticed the food that he bought from the market the day before was missing. So he just assumed that his girlfriend ate it. So then he went back to the store and bought more food. But then the next day, he went to his fridge and he noticed that food was missing. What the? Yeah, so he went to his girlfriend and asked her like, did you eat all the food in the fridge? And she's like, no. So then a couple days pass and Joe notices like a bunch of these like little dirty footprints on the ground of his apartment. So he asked his girlfriend, are these your footprints? And she's like, no. So then both of them are freaked out at this point and they realize that if it's not her, then it's somebody else. So they decide to get a camera to put in their apartment to record at all times. That's freaky. So they let the camera like record through the day and through the night. And then the next day, Joe played back the recording and you will not believe what they found on the camera. What? So the night before, you can actually see like a little lady climb down from the vent and she climbs on top of the table to like lower herself down. No way. Yeah, she even went to Joe's kitchen and opens up the fridge and just starts eating all his food and then she went to go pee in his sink because she knew that the toilet would be too loud okay that's gross you can even see during the night when joe went to go to the kitchen you see the lady go run and hide and then when joe went back to his bedroom she went back to the fridge and started eating his food again and after she ate his food she climbed on top of the table right and then went back into the vent and hit. Okay, this is really disturbing. What's really freaky is that Joe didn't realize that this lady was living in his apartment for years. And the lady knew Joe's like everyday life schedule so well that she never got caught by him until he used the camera and caught her and then had her arrested. Okay, stuff like this makes me so paranoid. It's like straight out of a movie. Have you heard of the craziest murder story of Catherine Knight? No. So Catherine Knight, was a lady who had really bad temper problems, right? And she did not have the best relationships. She had many relationships, but they went wrong. They were horribly wrong. So she then met this guy named John Price. Now, John Price had two kids of his own, and they really seemed to like Catherine Knight. So the relationship was going well, and then it started to go downhill. Okay. So she, like, framed him for different things like stealing. She tried to murder him, I think. What the heck is going on with these people? Yeah, so as it started to go downhill, they got in a really bad argument, and she tried to stab him in the chest with a knife. Now... 
Thankfully, it did not happen. So she tried to. She tried to, but she didn't succeed. Okay. So one night, Catherine Knight came home from work. She decided to cook herself a meal, watch TV. Then she went up to the room to her boyfriend who was sleeping. Okay. She then decides to grab a kitchen knife and stab her boyfriend that is sleeping 37 times. Oh, uh, so this time she waited till when he was sleeping to try to stab him. Yeah. And she did it. 37 times. Oh my God. Now he woke up in the middle of it. But it was at that point, it was too late. He couldn't fight back. So she killed him. She then dragged his body down the stairs. This is where it gets ridiculous. Oh, wait, it gets worse than the 37 times of stabbing. It gets worse. Oh, my God. Okay, so she dragged him down the stairs. She then hung the body on a meat hook. Because okay. she has a history of being a butcher. Okay? okay, so she hung him on a meat hook. She then skinned his body. Oh, my God. Cut off his head. <laughs> put, put, Ryan, she put his head in a boiling pot with vegetables wait why she's cooking him Wh oh my gosh dude she then cut up his body parts and put it in the same pot now this is where it gets even crazier okay how does it get crazier than that so she ends up cooking cooking the parts and then she passes out okay okay now now the boyfriend's co-workers call the police the next day because he didn't show up for work and he never misses so then the police Go to the house and find Catherine Knight laying on the ground, passed out, right? She then wakes up and she's like, I don't remember anything. They then find the head in the pot, okay? Oh, my God. Then there's two dinner plates, okay? Okay. Now, the two dinner plates have two name tags next to them. Okay. One name tag says another kid, one of the kids' names, and another name tag says another oh of the kids' names. Oh, my gosh, dude. Now. What are you saying? She was going to feed the kids their father no way she was gonna feed the kids their chopped up and cooked dad so she had plates ready and it was kind of like with everything on it already ready to feed them yes do you know about the brothers who escaped prison just by using a raincoat how would they do that with just a jacket so john anglin and clarence anglin were brothers and they went to prison for robbing a bank because they were trying to provide for their family and unfortunately they fell into crime so the prison they were in was the most secure prison in the whole world and it was called alcatraz and alcatraz was a max security prison located in san francisco so there was no chance of escaping and if you manage to escape you're stuck because you're on an island so you're gonna tell me they escaped alcatraz with a jacket so all the prisoners were given daily jobs to perform in the prison so for John and Clarence, they decided to work in maintenance because that would allow them to like to learn the ins and outs of the prison and perfect their way of escaping. So for weeks, they started to try to gather supplies to escape. And during the day when they were working in maintenance, they were actually designing tools that would help them escape. And the guards just thought they were just working on like what their job was supposed to do. John and Clarence would actually go to the cafeteria and steal spoons and they would turn the spoons into like little knives. And during lunch, when it was really loud, when like all the prisoners were out eating and hanging out, John and Clarence were in their cell using their spoons to poke a hole where their vent is to make a hole to escape and once they finished making their hole they covered up the hole with all their belongings so no one would see it nice they're escaping to be stuck on an island just wait so the next day john and clarence went to the maintenance building to do their work right but this time they made fake dummy heads they made it out of like hand soap and concrete and they molded it and they got real hair from the prison barber and they put it on the fake dummy they made fake heads yeah so that night they put their fake dummy heads in their bed to make it look like they were sleeping and when the guards weren't looking they crawled through their holes and escaped they then climbed a 30 foot pole to get to the ceiling where that one unsecure vent was and they climbed right out so what are they gonna do now they're stuck so you see days before john and clarence escaped prison they stole a bunch of raincoats from the prison like literal raincoats that you wear i don't see how that helps they ended up stealing 50 raincoats and they sewed them all together right and then there was a leaking pipe that was shooting out steam and they used that to inflate it and it ended up being a life raft for them so they made a literal boat out of raincoats yeah so they used the life raft to get away but there was one huge problem right the water was super cold like freezing cold the waves were really rough and they were also miles away from the mainland yeah i really don't see how they get out of that so the next day the prison guards went to john's cell and they noticed like john wasn't waking up so they open up the cell right and they try to wake up john and they shake his body but when they shake his body the fake head falls on the ground and breaks so immediately all the guards shut down the prison they informed the coast guards and the fbi to go search for the brothers but they never found the brothers so did they make it well all the FBI and all the Coast Guard thought they died. But there's actual evidence that may prove that they lived and lived a happy life. What? So Robert Anglin is the older brother to John and Clarence. And on his deathbed, he said that he was communicating with his brothers after they escaped prison, showing that they escaped. And every year after they escaped, they would send their mom flowers, right? And their mom would receive it and like they would have a card on it. And it was signed by John and Clarence. Even family members noticed that at all the family get togethers or at funerals, there were these two ladies that would wear veils on their face, covering their face. And they realized that it was actually 
actually John and Clarence in disguise. Dude, these guys are geniuses. So 13 years after they escaped the prison, one of their childhood friends actually found John and Clarence in Brazil and took a picture of them. Dude, nobody's supposed to be able to escape Alcatraz. Do you know about the kid that couldn't leave his house and he would spy on his neighbors and he actually caught a killer? No. So it's based on real events about a kid named Cal who actually got in trouble at his school for beating up his teacher and he was actually sentenced to house arrest. What? So he was forced to wear an ankle monitor around his ankle so it would track him wherever he went so he could never go outside. And every time he would try to leave his house, his ankle monitor would start flashing red and the police would come and have to give him a warning. Basically, he was stuck in his house and all he would do is play video games until his mom canceled his Xbox account and he was left with nothing to do. Dude, that sucks. Yeah, so it forced him to entertain himself. So what he would do is stare outside his window and observe his neighbors. Like he got to know all his neighbors routines really well. So he'd be like, this neighbor goes to work at this time. This neighbor's cheating on their husband. And like he just was so obsessed with watching his neighbors. That's a little creepy. So he ended up spying on his neighbor, Ashley, who he had a huge crush on. And it turns out she actually kind of liked him too. But one night Cal was watching the news and on the news, they were talking about this girl that went missing. But the last time they saw her, she was seen with a guy in a green Mustang. And later that night on Cal's street, he sees a green Mustang pull up with a dent on the front of the car. So Cal realized that that Mustang looked exactly like the same Mustang on the news. And it actually belonged to his neighbor, Mr. Turner. That's weird. So the next day, Cal, Ashley, and their friend Ronnie started spying on Mr. Turner. And that night they saw Mr. Mr. Turner bring home a girl from dinner and they thought like he might kill this girl. So they're spying on them and watching them, right? And they don't see anything weird. Until later that night, Cal got his binoculars and started looking at Mr. Turner's house again. And he saw the girl freaking out and screaming. So he's killing her. Yeah, so Cal gets his camera, but he forgets that the flash is on. So he takes a picture and the flash goes off and Mr. Turner sees him. Rookie mistake. So then Cal's freaking out. He's like hides underneath his window. And then he looks up and he sees the the girl's car drive off. So he's like, oh, so she's fine. She got away. Wait, she left? Yeah. So the next day, Cal wakes up and goes to his kitchen and Mr. Turner's in his house and Mr. Turner's helping Cal's mom and he looks like a really nice guy. So he's actually good then. Well, later that night, Cal and Ashley were back in Cal's room and they decided to look at Mr. Turner's house again and they noticed a bunch of blood on his window and they saw Mr. Turner dragging a big black trash bag down his steps and putting it into his garage. Dude, what is going on? So the next day, they decide to have Ronnie go sneak into Mr. Turner's car when he wasn't there but Ronnie like broke into Mr. Turner's car so he's trying to look for his garage clicker but he couldn't find it so when he was leaving his car Ronnie accidentally left his phone in Mr. Turner's car and forgot he did that Ronnie's messing up so that night Ronnie's freaking out right he's like I need to get my phone so they decide let's go try to break back into Mr. Turner's car so Ronnie goes back into Mr. Turner's car and he finds the garage clicker right but he can't find his phone so he goes into the garage to like looking for the phone but then the garage shuts so he's stuck in the garage but they find a body wait if they found a body they should just call the police yeah so they did call the police but when the police show up, they go look in Mr. Turner's garage and they couldn't find a body. So they no longer believe Cal and Ronnie. They think they're just lying and making it all up. So Cal's mom feels really bad for Mr. Turner because Cal's always accusing him of being a killer. So she goes to his house the next day and tells him like, I'm sorry. But Mr. Turner ends up knocking her out and holding her captive. How the tables have turned. And then Mr. Turner gets into Cal's house and he knocks out Ronnie. And then Mr. Turner started fighting Cal and Cal lost. Oh, come on. So Mr. Turner tried to make it look like Cal's responsible for all the murders. So he ties Cal up and makes Cal make a fake confession saying that he's the one that killed everybody. But luckily, Cal managed to get away by using a pen. A pen? Yeah, like he hit Mr. Turner with a pen and then he took off running. But Cal knows that he still has to prove that there's like a bunch of bodies somewhere, that Mr. Turner is actually the murderer. So he ran into Mr. Turner's house and he's looking for all the bodies. And then he goes into the basement and he finds a bunch of bodies. Wait, doesn't Cal still have his ankle brace on? Yeah, so since he has the ankle bracelet on, it goes off, right? And the police have to come because they think he's escaping. But when the police officer shows up at Mr. Turner's house, Mr. Turner kills the cop. Do not tell me this guy gets away with this. So Cal ends up fighting Mr. Turner again in his house and they're like fighting back and forth and Cal wins this time. And then Cal throws Mr. Turner into the basement with all the other dead bodies. And finally, the police believe Cal. Well, yeah, if there's a bunch of bodies under the house. Yeah, so Mr. Turner ended up having like hundreds of bodies under his house and Cal ended up being let off house arrest on good behavior and he just lived a happy life with Ashley. Okay, it is kind of scary to think that your neighbors could be killers. Have you ever heard of the nine-year-old kid that tricked the police into thinking he was someone else. How did he trick the police? So this was in Los Angeles, California, and it was a nine-year-old named Walter Collins who was going to the movies and he actually didn't come home. So his mom reported him missing. But after making those reports, there was a lot of reports of people citing him all the way in Oakland and San Francisco. But for months, no one was able to find this kid. But then just a few months later in Illinois, a kid said that he was Walter Collins and his appearance fit the missing report description. And he said on that day, he got kidnapped during the movies. Wait, so 
they found him. Just wait. So they flew him back to Los Angeles and he went to go live with his mom again. But after a few weeks of living with his mom, his mom went to the police and said, this is not my child. What the heck? So she started bringing the police like doctor records showing that the boy from Illinois did not match her son. And she even said that she started to realize that the boy would call her ma when Walter would always call her mother. And then she said that the boy from Illinois was one inch shorter than Walter. So the police were like, okay, let's just test the boy from Illinois. So what they did was they put him randomly in the neighborhood and said, okay, he has to find his way home. And if he does, he's your son. And he passed the test. How did he pass the test? Okay, so after he passed, they decided the mom was crazy. So they put her in a psychiatric hospital and they said, okay, let's just interrogate the kid one more time to hear his story. But this is where it gets really crazy. The boy told the police, I am not Walter Collins. What? Yeah, so he ended up being just a random kid that fit the description and he wanted to just move to LA so he could meet like movie stars and whatever. And there's a lot of theories on what happened to the real Walter Collins, but it's still a mystery on what happened to him. Dude, this is crazy.